Well, we're going to be in Psalm chapter 1 uh, this morning, Psalm chapter 1, and I've changed my teaching like, uh, I was going to say 10 times, but realistically it's three times, um, and I've finally arrived. Yesterday during, when I was hanging out in Soundcheck, I uh, wrote uh, a teaching from Psalm 1 in my notes and then transferred it to my iPad, and uh, we're going to go for it, because I just feel like that's what the Lord wants to say today. And if I'm wrong, I apologize. Um, <laughs> Psalm chapter 1, and I've titled this talk, um, and it's sort of this subject, that God wants you to become a tree. God wants you um, to become a tree. And we're going to talk about what that looks like um, this morning. God wants you to become a tree. I've come with a very (laughs) clear call of God on your life. God wants you to become a tree. I think, especially as, um, in student ministry, we deal a lot with uh, struggles with identity and calling. Um, and I think sometimes we, we get fixated on the specific will of God for our life um, when we need to learn to walk in the general will of God for our life. And this is something we tell our students all the time, that if you want to find God's specific will, you need to be walking in his general will. So I came this morning to give you a general will of God for your life. God wants you to become a tree. And uh, we'll talk about that. Psalm chapter 1. We'll read it together. I'm reading from the New King James. It says this. Blessed or happy or content is the one who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the path of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord. And in his law he meditates day and night. He shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water, that brings forth its fruit in its season, whose leaf shall not wither, and whatever he does shall prosper. The ungodly are not so, but are like the chaff which the wind drives away. Therefore the ungodly shall not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the ungodly shall perish." Let's pray together. Father, we thank you again for these moments we share. We ask that you would speak to us. And Holy Spirit, we ask that you would do a a deep, transforming work in our lives. And Lord, would you equip us and give us excitement about serving you? I know sometimes we come to these conferences really discouraged, and we want to be sort of encouraged back up to sort of neutral that we can just keep going. And Lord, we ask for just a freshness of your spirit that would not just give us the the faith to, to just sort of keep on, but that we would go home with fresh vision and excitement and love for the students and the people we get to minister to. And uh, we pray for your favor and blessing on our lives. And, Lord, as as we read, that you would help us to be content. As we sang, Lord, that you would help us to be content. We love you. It's in Jesus' name. Amen. So when I was about, uh, I think, 15 years old, it's before I drove, um, I was walking from... Uh, the beach, I, I, I'm from Vero Beach, Florida, and uh, we lived right across the street from the beach, and I was walking from uh, the beach back to my house. I was with my buddy and my little brother Shane, who's been playing the drums. Can we give it up for our, the worship team this morning? Oh my gosh. Thank you guys so much. Um, but uh, we were walking back, me and my buddy and Shane, Shane was kind of behind us, and uh, we were waiting for him. And I was talking with my friend, and I looked uh, behind him, and uh, we were on the sidewalk, and there was grass behind him, and I saw money. Um, behind him, cash. And when you're 15 years old, like, you're excited to see cash anywhere. Like, it's like so non-existent in your life. And, um, and I was so pumped to see cash. And uh, I mean, I get excited to this day when I find cash in my own pocket, and it belongs to me. You know what I mean? I'm like, oh my gosh. And it's like my money, and I'm like excited like it didn't belong to me. So to find somebody else's money is great. So I looked down, and uh, there was cash, and uh, I like, pushed my friend out of the way and picked it up, and no lie, it was a $100 bill. And I, 15 years old, just found a $100 bill, was over the moon. Now, I'm a good, generous person, and so I split it 50-50 with my friend. Didn't tell my little brother Shane. He didn't need to know about it. So we got 50 bucks each, like, suit for going to the beach. We were so excited. So... Um, we go home, do our thing. The next day, I'm going back to the same beach. And a same friend is with me, and uh, we're, we're skateboarding to the beach. And I'm, like, looking in the grass for more cash, right? I'm like, who knows? Maybe, maybe. 
And uh, we're going, and I get to the end of the path, and uh, no cash. I was really disappointed. Well, my friend was kind of behind me, and he goes, Nate. And he bends down, no joke, finds another $100 bill. So in two days, we've made 100 bucks each. We're like, this is, this is how, we're going to live like this the rest of our life. Like, we have found, we have found the money tree that everybody's been talking about all these years. Like, we found it. So, day three, I don't know why it was spread over days like this, but day three, no joke, I'm now on the same sidewalk. I'm not going to the beach, but I'm going to a friend's house that lives uh, down the street. And, and this time, I'm, like, a, a little more intentional with how I'm looking. And I'm skateboarding along, looking in the sidewalk, and I kid you not, day three, found another $100 bill. Three days in a row, $300. This is like, I mean, put yourself, you're 15 years old. You're finding money in the grass. I am convinced that something weird was going on in that patch of grass, right? There must have been like, may, like I'll leave the cash. You leave, you know, the gun in the bushes or the, like the drugs in the bushes. And, uh, and I kept interrupting. Like there's, probably so, like, I, I, there's probably like somebody out to get me somewhere. But anyways, $300. So day four, this time I'm convinced I'm finding the money tree, right? And uh, so day four, after finding $300, I'm looking around, um, and I get there. And this time it's, like, different because it wasn't easy. Like, I, I was looking day four for, like, where it had been, and it wasn't there. So I began to panic a little bit. I'm, like, going now into the bushes, like, past the grass. And at the end of that day, I, I couldn't find any more cash. It was done. Like, the tree withered away and died. Um, and I went home on day number four very disappointed, like almost mad, you know what I mean? Like I was like, what, what the heck? This isn't fair. Like I am out here, I am working hard today looking for cash and I can't find it. And I went home really disappointed and unsatisfied. And the reason I bring that up is kind of silly, but I think oftentimes when it comes to contentment or happiness or, or, or something like that, it, it feels a lot like that. It feels like we're chasing something, and as quickly as we get it, it feels like it's gone. And, and there's this reality, like, it's like, oh my gosh, I found $300 in a row, and yet on day four, I'm disappointed because it wasn't $400. And if it would have been day four, I would have found four. On day five, if there wasn't, I would have been disappointed. Does that make sense? That, that as soon as we, we feel like this is what it's going to take for me to be happy, for me to be content, for me to be satisfied. And then as soon as we arrive sort of at that location, we find actually, do you know what? Satisfaction is just up the road a little farther. And what this psalm is teaching us is at the deepest part of who we are, beyond what we experience, what we see, what we do, how to learn to be, like we sang about, content. The psalmist opens and he says, blessed is the one. And then he describes for us really how to find this idea of blessedness or contentment or happiness or satisfaction. And he describes really how to not be blessed and then how to be blessed. He's going to tell us how to not be content and then he's going to tell us how to be content. So that's what we're going to talk about and really with the goal of how to become a tree. So point number one, how do we become a tree? And sort of first thought in this idea of becoming a tree, it's found in who you aren't. Becoming a tree is found in who you are not. Look at again in verse one, it says, blessed is the man or blessed is the one who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, stands in the path of sinner, nor sits in the seat of the scornful. Now notice beginning it says, blesses the one or blesses the man. He's speaking to individuals. He's speaking to people. He's, or, or more specifically, he's speaking to person. How to find contentment and blessing in life and walking with God. He says, blessed is the one. I think in our day and age, we understand the idea of the one. We live in sort of a hyper-individualistic culture. And so the idea of oneness or like myself or I am going to find contentment, satisfaction, happiness, this is sort of the, the quest that most of humanity is on. How do I individually find happiness for myself? How do I as an individual, as a solo person, find blessing or favor or contentment in life? It's about what I want it's about what I do, and I am the center of my universe. Now, I think we're all pretty smart that we know that we're not the center of the universe. 
We get that. I think there's some level of all of us where we still think we're the center of our universe. Like my life, I am still the main character, right? Like at the end of the, at the, end of the movie, it's going to be starring my name. Like, we're first, like, this is what life is about. And because of this, I think the goal for life and the truest definition of life is found in self. And part of that, part of that reality is we don't discover who we are, we define who we are. In our world today, we don't discover who we are. We don't, we don't figure out who God has made us to be or who we're supposed to be. We define who it is that we are. So I am blank. I'm going to be successful, and I'm, I'm this, I'm that. And it, it sort of echoes or, or overshadows into every area of our, or really the human experience when it comes to what we see across the board in life and humanity and society and all of this stuff. But the idea is, is we don't necessarily discover who we are. We simply define who we are. But notice, this is, this is what I'm trying to get at. He, he connects the blessing of the one with who you're around. So he says, blessed is the one, blessed is the person who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly. So he's talking about individual blessedness or happiness or contentment. But the first thing he warns against is who you're around. And so there's this recognition that blessing and contentment and satisfaction is not, it's not singular in its identity. Does that make sense? It's not singular in, in what we do or, or what we experience and where we go. And yet so often, and I think even as in youth ministry and ministry as a whole, we've, we look for our, our blessing or we look for the favor, or we look for contentment in ministry and life in what we as individuals do or don't do. Does that make sense? So like our, our life is like, okay, what is God's calling for my life? And I think it's a great question to ask. But so often in the pursuit of like me, we miss out on what God is actually doing and who he wants us to be, but then also who he wants us to be around and the experiences he wants us to have because our life is, we're not autonomous in our experience and we're not autonomous, I think, even in our identity. And so learning to discover who God is making me to be, but then who is God making us to be as his church, as his people, as, as people that follow him and serve him. And so he connects the blessing of the one with who you're around. Now, let's break this down. First thing he says is, blessed is the one who walks not in the counsel of the wicked. Question sort of I want to th- pose to us with this idea is, who speaks into your life? He says, blessed is the one who, who, who walks not in the counsel of the wicked. Who speaks into to your life? And then maybe more specifically, what questions are they asking you? We may not be sort of around the wicked counselors. Like, I feel like that's just funny language. Like, blessed is the one who walks not in the counsel of the wicked. And you picture, like, I don't know, I picture, like, a dark, like, scary table with, like, evil, like, I don't know, like the villain in James Bond or something like that. Like, wicked counselors. And that, that's probably not, like, the people we hang out with. Like, oh, yeah, that person's wicked counselor. Um, but I think sometimes, maybe that they, they aren't necessarily wicked counselors, but they aren't giving you godly counsel, or they aren't even asking you the right questions. Sometimes, and, and I, I'm guilty of this in the people that I surround myself with, where I don't receive the right questions, or I don't ask the right questions. Meaning we can walk through ministry and life really on the surface with people, and we, we just assume that they're doing well, and they assume that we're doing well, but they're not asking us the questions that actually we need to be, need to be asked. Like, how are you actually doing? Like, how's your soul? How's your marriage? How's your relationship with God? Are you praying? Are you in God's word? Are you, are you growing? Are there things that you're struggling with? Are, these thing, are there things that you're keeping secret? Like, are, there, are people asking you the right questions? Because I think if they're not asking you the right questions, or if you don't have the right counsel in your life, it can sort of by default become wicked counsel. Because it, it is true that we need people in love and in truth to come alongside of us and say, how are you doing? And what you're doing right now may not be right. And if they're not doing that for our own sake, 
like for ourselves, going back to the individual, like for ourselves, if people, if we're not allowing ourselves to be asked hard questions, I would suggest that maybe they are, it's dramatic, but wicked counselors to us. The, are you positioning yourself in a place where people can ask you hard questions, and then are you willing to receive when those people, and, and be honest um, when those questions are being asked? So walks not in the counsel of the wicked. And then it says, secondly, stands in the way of sinners, or stands in the path of sinners. Path speaks of direction, right? Right? Stands in the paths of sinners. It speaks of direction. So specifically, what are your goals? What is navigating your direction? What is shaping your choices, your ambitions, and ultimately your destination? What is, what is shaping your choices? What is shaping your direction? And then ultimately, what is shaping your destination? Where are you going to arrive? Where is the direction that you're heading in going to arrive? Like, what is, where is it going to take you to? And sometimes what's shaping our direction is the people around us, right? Oftentimes, like, who we surround ourselves with um, shapes our direction. Um, when I preach to students, I have a very simple formula of when I teach. It is Jesus and friends almost every single message. It is Jesus in the sense of, like, relationship with God, and that looks like prayer, that looks like scripture, that looks like uh, uh, obedience and repentance and all this thing. And then part two, almost every message I preach is, and your friends, who are you surrounding yourself with? Jesus and friends. It's like the simplest template to speak to students, um, and it can, it can go like any direction. But I think when you're young, you need to understand how God views you in your relationship with him, and you need to understand the influence that people have on your life. So my, I'm doing a student message right now. Who do you surround yourself with? Right? And sometimes the path that shapes us or the direction that we're heading in is shaped by the people that we're around. Other times it's shaped because we don't have clear direction. In other words, we sort of end up um, sometimes just by rev going back to our default setting. Like sometimes if you're not intentional with where you're heading, you're just going to arrive somewhere. Does that make sense? And so sometimes you're like, there's, there's a path that we're on, and the direction that we're heading in is just sort of like, it's just happening. It's not intentional. It's not, it's not decisive. There's no rhythms or routines or habits or goals that we've set up. And so we're just kind of on this path going in a direction that isn't necessarily where we're supposed to be going, but we're not doing anything to shape or create a direction. Because ultimately, you become what you do, right? Right? Over time, what you do no longer is just some, something that you do. It becomes who you are. So if you lie, over time, you become a liar, correct? Like, that's just what happens. Like, it's not, oh, they just lie every once in a while. Like, if, that, if you're late, no longer it's not, oh, that person's late. Like, that person, they, like, have a priority thing. There's something going on deeper than just, oh, they're late all the time. Does that make sense? Because over time, you become who you are. And so I think sometimes you, you have to look at where, what it, the path that I am I'm on, where is it taking me? Um, so I haven't really shared this with anybody, but a couple of friends. I think if my dad's watching this online, he's going to find out right now. But um, about a year ago, I started going to therapy. And I, nothing really major happened in my life. There was some seasons of difficulty in ministry that I just was like going through. And I felt like I just needed outside perspective. And so for the past year, I've been going to see a therapist. And um, one of the primary reasons I started doing this was because I felt like the, the word to describe my character was frustrated. Like in, every, like in every detail of my life, if you were to like summarize, like what is Nate's like feeling towards that? It would be frustrated. I just am like, and I'm, st I'm still working on it, so bear with me. But I just feel like I'm always, ah, frustrated. Like, and I come off frustrated and like how I speak to people can sound frustrated and my body language looks frustrated. And like people come up to me and be like, is everything all right? And I feel like everything's fine, but like my face is like, he's frustrated. You know what I'm saying? So, and I just felt like that path, that direction 
like, as you get older, you don't get better naturally. Does that make sense? Like, as you get older, you, you just sort of get worse. And your worst characteristics sort of become amplified over time. And, I, and this is like without the grace of God and without the spirit of God, you know, doing what he does in our life. But over time, you just get worse. That's why like a lot of times you, old people are just like grumpy and agitated and frustrated. And then you meet those ones that aren't. And I believe that so much of that is, is in who they were like now. Like so you're young, who you are now. And the, the character that's being developed in you and where it's going to take you. And so basically all that to say is I saw myself as an old man, as a frustrated, grumpy, lonely old man. And I was like, I don't want that to be, I don't want that to be me. I want to be somebody that grows in grace and compassion and, and that, that I'm like kind <laughs> and like I'm a joy to be around. And I just felt like there... The, the path that I am on, does that make sense? The direction that I'm heading in is not leading me into sort of depth of character that I want to have happen. And so the stands in the path of sinners, what is the path that you're heading on? And then third thing, he says, sits in the seat of the scornful. Scornful, it means to talk arrogantly. And unless we're being transformed by Jesus, the longer we're... I'm going to say a blanket statement, and hopefully it makes sense. But unless we're being transformed by Jesus and his spirit, we're sensitive to what he's doing. The longer we we're around the things of God, it can breed scorn or contempt or cynicism to God and what he's doing. You can just, like, and I've walked through seasons of this. Like I said, I've been in ministry for 10 years. I got saved right out of high school or my senior year of high school and then started serving in our, our youth ministry at 18. Um, and then took over our youth ministry shortly after and have been there ever since. And I've had seasons of where, like, deep scorn or, or cynicism can, begins to develop in us. And so when you sit in the seat of the scornful, I guess what is your reaction to other people, specifically their success? So scornful is like when you sit around and you, you talk arrogantly about something or someone. And in ministry, we have to guard ourselves from sitting around and talking arrogantly about other people's ministry and other people's success. There is a pressure, I think, especially on youth pastors, and oftentimes we feel the only way to validate our youth ministry is by mocking somebody else's. Right? So, so we go like, our youth ministry only has 10 people, and the, the youth ministry up the street has 200 people, but they're not preaching the word like we are. Or, or our youth ministry is like um, whatever it is. You know, we, we have a bunch of great volunteers, and this church over there doesn't, and like, man, we're crushing it. And it's so easy for us to really to sit in the seat of the scornful where we sit around arrogantly puffed up about who we are, or even, I think, more so in youth ministry, if we're honest, who we're not, right? Like, because I think all of us, there's a level of insecurity where we're like, I know I want this to be bigger and better, and we want to reach more people and all of that, so we know we're not there, but it's really easy for us to sit in the seat of the scornful and be like, well, we're not them, and like, man, we're not doing it like them. And gosh, they're just preaching such a soft message or they're, you know, they don't know how to do community ride or whatever it is. And we sit around and in order to validate what we're doing, um, we sort of tear down what somebody else is doing. So he says, is blessed is the man who walks not. So the first thing he tells us how to be blessed, how to be a tree is by what you don't do or who you're not. Also notice that this is a progression. Walks, stand, sits. This, this speaks of thinking, behaving, and then ultimately belonging. That, that there's this progressive way that we can become something that God is not trying to make us become. We're wanting to become a tree, and the first warning of this text is warning against becoming something else. So it's in who you're not. But then the second thing, um, in how to become a tree, it is in who you are. Continuing on in verse 2, he says, But in contrast to, to these people or to this person, his delight is in the law of the Lord, 
and his law he meditates day and night. So a couple things I want you to notice. First, um, the author says, his delight is in the law of the Lord. Delight speaks of joy. D- delight speaks of excitement. Delight s- speaks of sort of nourishing and good and healthy. Um, but also delight is different than desire, right? Delight is different than desire. For instance, I desire six-pack abs. Like it's a desire of mine. Um, but I, I delight in donuts. Does that make sense? Like so the, the delight in order to have six-pack abs has to be greater than even the desire to have six-pack abs. Because if I actually delighted in it, then I'd be up early doing crunches and not up early at our coffee shop eating the baked goods. Does that make sense? There would be a, there would be a different um, priority in my life. And so what, what, what they say here is that you must learn to not just desire God's word, but actually delight in God's word. Delight in the law of the Lord. And we have to really make it a, a not just a goal of ours, but a, but a practice of ours to delight in God's word. And I think we delight in God's word through a, a number of different ways, or delight maybe more specifically in who God is and in his presence, um, through rhythms and routines, so one of the things uh, I think that is really helpful when in making a, the word of God and time with Jesus a delight in your life is anchor it to a rhythm in your life that you already enjoy. So like I love getting up early and making coffee and having peace and quiet. I love it. Like it, it, I go to bed sometimes at night just excited to fall asleep so I could wake up the next morning and make my coffee and be alone. You know what I mean? And so what I do is in that time, that's when I sp- spend my time in God's word, in prayer, journaling, thinking about what God's doing in my life and how he wants to change me. But I anchored a, a really a goal, a desire with a rhythm and routine that I already had. Maybe that's not you. Maybe you like to stay up late or, or whatever it is. Um, find a way that you can work time in with Jesus into not just like, okay, I added it into my life, but I made it a delight, something that I look forward to, that I enjoy being with God. I think another way, not just rhythms and routines, but maybe sacred space, what I mean by that is having a, a, a place or a, 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 whether it's a table or a coffee shop or something, some place that is like, okay, this is where I'm going to sort of designate my time to be with God. And then I would say third, making God's uh, delight would be awareness and presence. Just um, recognizing that God is with you all the time. Sometimes I loved what um, Pastor Wesley said yesterday about bridging the gap. And, and I think um, one of the things I talk about with our, our students, I actually just had a conversation with a young girl the other day in our student ministry who was struggling with stuff. And I said, one of the problems you're having is that what you're finding in relationship with God and the joy that you're finding there and being in church and around his people, and then the rest of your life is really disconnected. So you have all of this excitement to come to youth and to do these things, and then you leave it there, and there's a disconnect between your, your time with God and your everyday life. And we understand, we know this text, there's, we can't escape the presence of God, but oftentimes he escapes our mind <laughs> And so we're not aware of his presence in our life. So we must learn to invite God, practice his presence in our life, make ourselves more aware of what God's doing in any given moment. And honestly, if you just going through life and just like, okay, you're going to lunch, God, thank you, you're here. Not just thank you for the meal, like we do our thing, but like, like your presence is here. And just becoming, practicing a way of making yourself more aware of God in your life. Psalm 37, 4, we know this verse. It says, delight yourself in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. Delight will then lead to the desire. Someone challenged me with this verse uh, about a, uh, maybe a year and a half ago, and it was like one of those verses that just haunted me because I just knew how far off I was from this idea of delighting in God's presence. 
I knew it felt like a chore. It felt like work. I was really struggling with balancing, like, prepping for a message and spending time with God on my own and feeling like I used to work at a, um, well, I, I worked at a restaurant as a busboy, and I, I didn't like going and eating at that restaurant because I just felt like I was there all the time. The smell was so familiar. I knew what was going on in the back in the kitchen, and I was like, I just don't want to eat there. Sometimes, honestly, when it comes to Bible teaching and being someone that has to study the Word all the time, it's, it's, it, it almost feels like a chore to be like, oh, my gosh. Like, I don't want to go to work, you know what I mean, like on my off day, and I don't want to, like, wake up early on my off day to do what I have to do for work. Does that make sense? It's like such a weird space that we find ourselves in. And so learning to delight in God, in his presence, in your relationship with him. I'm gonna, how long do I have? What, what time am I supposed to be done? Or for real? Okay, I'm going to speed up. Whew. I got a lot to say. Okay. Because um, I haven't even got to the part I really want to talk about. So we're going to move on. The, um, and then he, he responds. He says, meditates it in it day and night. So it's constant. Right? God's word is something that you do in a moment. Like you spend time in God's word. He delights in God's word. And he meditates in it day and night. It's not just something you do and you're done. It's something that you carry with you in your life. Okay. Second point is this. Um, what does a tree look like or what a tree looks like? So we talked about how we become a tree. Um, it's in what you, it's in who you're not and who you are and then what a tree looks like. Look at verse 3. He says, he um, or she shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that brings forth in its fruit in its season, whose leaf also shall not wither, and whatever they do shall prosper. This is essentially what Jesus teaches in John 15. John 15, Jesus says, abide in me and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. He tells us three ways to sort of be like a tree, to be planted. Number one is to be planted by rivers. Planted by rivers. This would speak of being planted in the right place. Being planted in the right place. Because a, a tree planted by the river of waters has what it needs regardless of what the, the weather is like. So uh, a tree planted by a river is going to soak up the nutrients from the soil and the water that it's by, so it's not entirely dependent upon what the weather is like. And being planted in the right place means you have what you need in dry seasons and in good seasons. Planted, it also speaks not just of where you are, but who you are. It speaks of identity. It's an inward work. And part of identity is, is both now and not yet. And what I mean by that is it's who you are, identity, and it's who you're becoming. So, like, especially talking about the idea of becoming, I think many of us can focus on where we need to go. But there's parts of our identity and, and who God's making us to be in who we are right now. So you are called you are cho- currently, not one day, you, right now you are called, you are chosen, you are set apart, you are salt and light, you have what you need, you're more capable than you think you are. Like right now, you are, you're, there's an identity, you're planted, God is doing this work in you. He's making you someone, but also right now God is, he's made you someone. And so you need to be planted in the right place. The second thing it says it is producing or bears fruit, produces good fruit. Planted in the right place will produce the right things in your life, right? So abiding in Jesus, being planted with him, understanding your identity, understanding what God's doing in you, understanding who you are currently will produce in your life the things that God wants you to produce. But also notice, I don't necessarily like this part of the verse, but it also says in due season. That means that every season of life and ministry is not fruit-bearing season. Every season of life and ministry is not fruit-bearing season. Sometimes it's planting season. Sometimes it's waiting season. Sometimes it's stormy season. And then ultimately it makes way for 
fruit-bearing season. So can I encourage you right now, especially maybe if you're early on in, in student ministry, maybe right now you're in a planting season where you're like, where are the students? Where are the people? Where's the fruit? Where's the life change? Keep planting. Keep watering. Keep waiting. Keep trusting what God is doing. And allow in due season, as you remain planted, for him to produce the right things at the right time. Because the right thing at the wrong time can even be the wrong thing. And so learning to go, okay, God, what, what you're doing and when you're doing it is exactly what I need. Third thing, I'm going to sp- speed it up. I got two more thoughts. Leaf that doesn't wither. He says that, that you're planted, you'll be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that brings forth fruit in its season, whose leaf shall not wither. This idea is that you remain there. Or in other words, you stay planted for a long time. You continue to produce. It's not about walking with God or serving God for a little bit of time, but for a lifetime. And understanding who you are and understanding what God is doing in and through your life is key in, in doing it for a long time. The, the average, I'm sure you guys know this, the average uh, lifespan of a youth pastor is one and a half to two years. So that's not even seeing freshmen graduate. Okay? I, when I first started in youth ministry, I was not planning on being around for very long. I did not want to be in ministry. I didn't want to be a youth pastor. None of that. Okay? Ten years Clearly, something has changed. Um, but I remember being at a conference early on. It was actually with uh, Calvary Vista at Green Valley. It, it was 2011. I just graduated high school. I assisted our youth pastor on a trip out here. And I was just sort of starting to take over, and, and things were happening. And um, I told this person, like, yeah, I, I'm just here. Like, I'm not, I'm not going to be here very long. And he said, you should try to see freshmen graduate. And I laughed. I was sitting, you guys been to Green Valley, like the, the table with all the animal heads and stuff. And I was sitting at the, one of the tables and laughed. And I was like, there is no way I'm going to see freshmen graduate. And now I've seen it almost three times over. Um, but uh, the, the, the average lifespan of a, of a youth, youth pastor is at one and a half to two years. And not that, not that I'm saying you have to be in youth, youth ministry longer. Maybe God's going to call you out. What I am saying is that you recognize that if you're called, you're called, and we're doing it for a lifetime. And your position may change, but your purpose does not change. Who God has made you to be remains regardless of where you are serving. But what I want to see in my deepest desires for young people, and I, this is one of my, like, catchphrases is what I just said to you, is that walking with God is not for a little bit of time, but it's for a lifetime. And I tell I, probably Jesus friends and that quote, I say almost every teaching. Because I want to see young people, like we, we want, like the Bible is about generations, right? It's not about now, it's about generations. And we want to see young people grow up and raise kids and walk with God for a long time. And we want to be people that are planted, that don't wither away, that continue to b- produce fruit. I love Psalm 92. It says, the righteous shall flourish like a palm tree. He shall grow like a cedar in Lebanon. Those who are planted in the house of the Lord shall flourish in the courts of our God. They shall still bear fruit in old age, and they shall be fresh and flourishing. All right, last thing. Is the worship team coming up here, or is it just? Okay, worship team, come on. Help me close this thing out. Appreciate it. Um, The last thing uh, we're going to look at is there in verse 3, talking about how to be a tree. Planted, brings forth fruit, leaf does not wither away, and whatever they do shall prosper. This part is interesting. This, this word is interesting because prosperity is, is really an interesting word in our world today. Prosperity, right? When we, even when we say that word, there's all sorts of thoughts that could go through our mind. It's like prosperity. Right? And some of us are like, ugh, that's a bad word. Right? Because we think about like, you know, some type of preaching that's like not in line with the life of Jesus and the teaching of Jesus. And we're like, no, bad word. Or, or prosperity, we have some sort of false image of, of what that looks like or what that might, what we might experience. And so the question, I guess then, is how do we define prosperity. Because this verse is clear, okay? The verse is, um, 
you'll be like a tree, you will be planted, and whatever you do shall prosper. Now, I read that verse, and I want that. And, and I don't care what version of the word prosperity we use. I want that. Whatever you do shall prosper. Anybody with, like, whatever I do, I want it to prosper. I want to have, like, the, the Midas touch. <laughs> like, that's kind of how we think. of Everything I do, like, I want it to prosper. So then the question is, what we have to understand, is how do we find, define prosperity, especially in ministry? Or in other words, how do you measure success? Or how do you measure the favor of God on your life? How do you measure the favor of God on your life? One of the things that kills pastors, kills young leaders, is the wrong measure of success or the wrong definition of prosperity. The wrong measure of success and the wrong definition of prosperity. Whether it stems from comparison, right, our life, and we compare it to other people's lives, and we think, wow, that is prosperity, that is favor, that is blessing. Whatever they do will prosper, but whatever I'm doing is not prospering. And so there's comparison. And can I, man, can I encourage you, especially if you're early on in the youth ministry, you're, you're called to be you. Okay? If God wanted you to be them, he would have made two of them. God called you to be you. And so whatever, how your voice matters, how you, uh, how you do ministry matters, how you relate to students matter. Um, you are not called to be them. You're called to be you. So if you can release, even, man, I look back on some of my old, how I, how I even preached. And you'd be like, yep, he's trying to sound like that guy. Like, yep, yep, you told, he's subscribed to that podcast. That's who he's trying to be like. And because there's so much, like, pressure to compare and then conform. And what we have to learn is, like, okay, God has called me to be me. But the wrong measure of success can come from comparison or observation, maybe seeing something or someone that we would like to experience or imagination. Like, this is what I think it, it means. Because we often view prosperity or favor, like, if we're honest, as big ministry Lots of influence and lots of affluence, right? Like, that's favor. I, I had a, um, a, I do like a Tuesday afternoon Bible study with a group of students. And um, we, we looked at this passage of scripture. And I said, how do you measure prosperity? How do you define, I, I said it like this. How do you define God's favor on someone's life? And they're like, well, you know, they're, they're healthy. And they're, you know, they have, they're happy and they have this thing and that thing. And I just was like, ugh, no. That's, you're wrong. You're wrong. Because, because you can have none of those things and have God's favor on your life. You can have a tiny ministry. You can have no followers on Instagram. You, like, have no subscribers to your YouTube channel. Like, you're, you're, nobody knows your name. You're not writing blogs. Like, you, you, you could have n none of that in ministry, and yet everything you are doing can prosper. So our definition of prosperity, we have to understand the, pro the, the right definition of prosperity. Contextually, do you know, want to know what the right definition of prosperity is? It's contentment. It's fruitfulness in every season, and it's endurance, right? Contentment, blessed, happy. It's fruitfulness in the right season. It's God producing what he wants to in your life, and it's endurance. It's you're not going anywhere. You're not giving up because it's got difficult or because you got discouraged or because it didn't turn out the way you wanted or because you thought by now you'd be here and you're not or somebody hurt you in the church or your, or your pastor doesn't recognize you like you should be recognized or you're not getting paid enough or you're not getting enough support. And so you're, there's, this, there's this lack of endurance. Prosperity is contentment in every season. It's fruitfulness in every season. And it's endurance through, come on, every season. God wants you to be a tree. And we do that in who you're not and who you are. And as he does this deep transforming work in our life and ultimately through our life. Let's pray together. 
Father, we thank you. God, we thank you so much just for the work that you're doing in us. And Lord, we want to submit ourselves, humble ourselves to your spirit working in us. And Lord, if there's things that need to be changed or maybe even ways of thinking that we need to sort of rewire, be it our measure of success or, or comparison or um, lack of contentment, Lord, would you do that work in us? Help us to be and learn to be, like the Apostle Paul said, content. And Lord, at the end of the day, we just want to be found faithful. We, we, Lord, forgive us for when we, we think that fruitfulness only is the mark of successful ministry. Lord, we recognize that faithfulness is the primary mark of healthy ministry. Faithful to you faithful to the people we get to serve, faithful to our spouses, faithful to our friends, faithful for, to whoever is, is over us. Lord, help us to be found faithful. We love you in Jesus' name. Amen.